Freemasons are thought to be the world's oldest fraternity. Their origins are shadowed in a mysterious past. They have been much imitated and lampooned, put on the highest pedestal, and held in dark suspicion. There are over two million regular Freemasons in North America today. Freemasonry may be the world's oldest secret society, but paradoxically, it is also the most well-known. According to its own history, Masonry became public in 1717, drawing on traditions dating back to the building of King Solomon's Temple. In the nearly 300 years since that time, countless books, stories, and recently thousands of websites have set out to expose the secrets of Freemasonry. One of the most interesting things these exposés have in common is how little they actually reveal. Funny handshakes, silly walks, weird rituals and amateur theatrics do very little to explain anything fundamental about Freemasonry. There are secret societies that have been around for thousands of years, I think. I get the impression there are no girls allowed. They have a special handshake. Aren't Shriners a Masonic order? Yeah, I think they, Shriners. They, the ones who drive around in little cars have children's hospitals. We take a first ever insider's look at Masonic ceremonies and follow a group of initiates, not just through the handshakes and rituals, but inside the modern Masonic Lodge, inside the hearts and minds of modern Masons. I don't know anything about them. Yeah, that's right. And I think that's the point. <laughs> They're a secret society. You're not supposed to know about them. Through the later part of the 20th century, the number of new members declined almost to a crisis level within some lodges. Now, early in the 21st century, masonry has experienced a renaissance. Young men in their 20s and 30s are joining in record numbers. If we can understand why young men at the dawn of the 21st century would be drawn to the world's oldest and most well-known secret society, we may also understand the lodge, its history, power, and purpose. The shroud of secrecy surrounding Freemasonry is beginning to lift. Recently in Canada, journalists had the opportunity to talk to a diverse group of Masons about the craft as they call Freemasonry. We're looking at the changes in Freemasonry. Today its stature is sort of, could be argued is not what it was at one time. And I'm curious if, if that's a, an agreeable idea why its stature might have uh, changed. It hasn't. It hasn't? No. One of, the, one of the, the prime motives behind masonry is that it doesn't. And masonry is essentially the same as what it was when it was first instituted back around 1650 or so. In my work I get to travel a lot and I get to see other Masonic lodges around the world and I can travel anywhere and go into a lodge and even when I'm not comfortable with the language, if I'm in Spain or France, I'm still fairly comfortable in the lodge, partly because I'm being made to feel at home, but partly because the, the ritual and the ceremony and the traditions are so similar. Within the framework of the traditions, which as Vic points out, we all promise when we go into the lodge not to change or innovate on, I think is the phrase. But within that, there's room to uh, evolve. In Masonic ritual, the question, what is Freemasonry, requires an answer memorized by rote by all Freemasons. A peculiar system of morality, veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. It's a poetic and pat answer, but it does little to explain, even to the Masons themselves, why the organization exists. Think of what a radical group it was at one time and then how it's now is its whole purpose is to preserve it as you know, stasis well, but I, in, in a, so it's, and it's become this perceived as this conservative. I like to think of masonry as like a, an historical fire axe like break glass in case of fire like so if you're if you're in some really hard times like where I believe mm. the Western world was in, in the early 18th century, Mason can come along and do a lot of good stuff just by talking about liberty, equality, faith, hope, charity. And that century ended with a lot of change brought about mm. under the influence of men who are also Freemasons. I think that's But were they speaking the out in public or they weren't? They were just bringing about, they were people who were 
There were men who were Freemasons bringing about change. Well, was Ben yeah. Franklin speaking in public? I, I think so. Yeah. As yeah. a Freemason, well, he he yeah. spoke his ideals, and I think and I think this is this is one of the interesting things about the lodge is how many of its ideas spill over into popular culture. I had a friend told me that they're like the mafia, but I don't believe. I think they're just rich old men. They're pretty much like the stone cutters from The Simpsons, if I'm not mistaken. Or the loyal order of water buffalo the, from the uh, Winston <laughs> Yeah. A society with secrets. With so many famous and influential Freemasons, it's surprising how difficult it is to get accurate information about masonry, even for masons themselves. I've been a mason for 52 years. Wilf Creighton has been a mason in Canada for over half his life, which is impressive at 100 years old. I remarked to a friend of mine one day, I'd like to join the masons. And he said, oh, you, you have to be invited. He wasn't a mason himself, but his father was a very active one. And I thought he knew what he was talking about. For some, masonry is a family tradition. Kevin Saunders is a third-generation Freemason. Most people that I run into in the run of a normal day have never heard of the order. Like, they see my ring, and people ask what the symbol is, and I tell them, and they're just like, well, what's that? Bless now thy servant before thee, who is about to assume new and important relations to his brothers. Give him wisdom, give him strength, give him love. So long and be. A mason is a knight of morality. A first-generation Italian-Canadian, Sergio Sani defines Masons according to a strict moral code. A Mason is a man that has the confidence enough in himself and his brothers to act according to his moral judgment. When you ask me what is a Mason, I almost immediately slip into the rhetoric learned in the Lodge to respond to that, you know, uh, a Mason is a man, freeborn, uh, with, you know, goodwill towards his fellows, da-da-da, who wants to improve himself, and Masonry supplies the symbolic tools in, in order that he, that he improve himself. But do symbols, signs, and secrets distinguish a Mason from the Phi Kappa Pi's and Rotarians of the world? The Masons believe that meaning as deep and as old as the Ark of the Covenant lies within their ritual, and they spend lifetimes looking for it. Maybe we'll just uh, clarify a bit of the definition of, of uh, a Freemason. What people on the street may get confused with the Rotary Club or Knights of Columbus or any of these other fraternal groups that exist. Um, would I, any of the Masons like to clarify the distinction? I'll do that. Okay. Uh, Rotary Club is a service club, uh, largely consists of businessmen who get together to, uh, to basically schmooze as well as to raise money for good projects. So there's no, uh, as far as I know anyway, uh, any kind of spiritual uh, element to it. The um, Knights of Columbus is a purely Roman Catholic organization. Uh, the Masonic uh, order is uh, something that uh, certainly includes elements of, you know, charity, raising money for good projects and that sort of thing. Masonry is not a service club. We do not network for business reasons. We network because we want to have shared the same kind of spiritual and moral experiences with people that are close to us. When I think of masonry, there's a few things that come to mind. The first thing is Mozart's opera, The Magic Flute, and it's about the Freemasons. I think about guys wearing aprons with little aluminum doodads on them. Mm -hmm. And I think about a secret club of just straight white Christian old boys. Shall forget that day. I'm satisfied. Everybody have one perception of it. Another person will have another perception, but I know the real truth. Before I met anybody who was actually a Mason, I, I heard a bunch of rumors like these people are uh, white supremacists and you know a bunch of horror stories, devil worshippers. My mother was Roman Catholic, so she thinks that they're the Antichrist. To this day, membership in Freemasonry, if revealed, is a valid reason why someone could not be married in a Catholic Church. The Catholic Church has a severe problem with people being Masons because when, when you, you become a Mason, you uh, profess a belief in a supreme being. 
and that being can take whatever shape you choose it to take, but you can't be a Catholic and go for that. If you consider this as a culture and not a religion, and I can accept mm -hmm. that as a closer metaphor, think about culture is that living cultures change. And so you have this thing where tradition's important, and, and you, you mentioned the word, or someone mentioned the word evolve, the, the, yeah. it will evolve. But there must be a tension there as well. Our awareness of grace becomes a perception of our connection with the divine force. The study of the darker forces of masonry over the past 20 years has been centered in the UK. Professor Andrew Prescott is a non-mason who is the director of Masonic Research at the University of Sheffield in England. To my mind, it's offering a kind of supra-religion. It's, it's a religious view that goes above the organized religions and almost comes up with its own religion. You could also argue, uh, and some have argued, that it was a kind of failed attempt to create a religion. The ancients used to say, know thyself, you will know the universe and God. It's not, not a religion, per se, but there's a spiritual element in that we do try to um, make uh, the phrases that's often used is to make good men better men. Many, many young men in their 20s and early 30s are coming forward for membership. They're approaching Grand Lodge and saying, we'd like to be Freemasons. Chris Connop is the new director of marketing for the Grand Lodge of England. They've seen the website or they've read certain articles in magazines and so on, and, th and they're intrigued by it. Why would anyone want to be a Freemason? There are over five million men in the world today trying to make themselves better through Freemasonry. Who has time to memorize ancient ritual rhetoric in the busy modern world? To understand the symbolic and spiritual quest that has captured the imaginations of millions, we look to the newest wave of young Freemasons. I'm sort of a black and white sort of a person. It's right or it's wrong. And there's a certain, uh, I believe, in a certain moral code and a certain way to do things. Dave Davis is a computer tech with an interest in military history. Intrigued after hearing about Freemasonry from his friend Sergio Sani, he decided to join the Lodge. I hope to be able to bring that belief in myself along to the Lodge just to strengthen it that much more. Uh, because I, I do believe that structure, uh, chain of command, is, is something that makes everything run smoothly, more efficiently. We are learning music, uh, military music mostly. Uh, it's a cadet band, a uh, sea cadet band. And this is our rehearsal night, Sunday night. Here it goes again! It's going to happen again! Wes Mackey Jr. is a well-traveled big band musician who now leads a Canadian military cadet band. I give the musical direction uh, and leadership direction, I guess. Try to build a, I make good citizens as uh, confident young adults. Do not go past the point where you started, eh? Because we have to line up again. We're not lining up. So do not go like many traditional big band jazz musicians, from Duke Ellington to Oscar Peterson, Wes has decided to join the Brotherhood of Freemasonry. Part of the reason why I did join was because it was a, a men's only organization once I knew what it was all about. And that's because I think, you know, uh, especially today when fathers are away from families, I, mean, I think males still need a bonding thing of some sort. They're not like women where they can just hug and cry together. They, they get to actually have something to organize and do together. But I think mostly I joined just to improve myself. Self-improvement is often a spiritual journey, wanting to feel part of something larger. This search for spiritual belonging led Aldrich Benson to Freemasonry. I don't know, I was uh, actively involved in my faith. My, I'm a Catholic, and uh, I haven't been doing it for quite some years. Not that I've lost, well, yeah, I've lost faith in, in that particular religion, I guess you could say. But I miss the whole doing things for others. And I was coming to the point where I was going to go back to that faith, and I really didn't want to. After leaving his home in St. Lucia, Majo Gifford is exploring the world and music. His journey has led him far from home and the lodge of his father, but he sees Masonic connections everywhere in the world. 
the more you learn about the world and different topics in life, you get a different perspective on it. I grew up being a Catholic. I was always in the church and I was actually supposed to become a priest, but um, I started um, delving more into religion and it didn't make sense to me actually that religion is just basically a way of bringing people together. As an officer, he should remember first of all that he is an individual Mason, sharing in that respect a common lot with his brethren and therefore interested in the welfare. In Masonic people. literature it says, to be one, ask one. Even for those with Masonic friends or family, joining Masonry must be done by application and secret ballot. If a black ball appears in the ballot, the candidate is blackballed, rejected from becoming a Freemason. No explanation, no discussion. I uh, felt that, uh, that I was let in into something wonderful. It was quite an experience because now I can look at him and uh, we'll say, hey, you know, we were there together on, the, on that night. The accepted candidates then begin the three principal degrees of Freemasonry, entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason. I wasn't really worried about what was going to happen studying for the first. The majority of it was getting through, through the text, through the literature. Some of the, some of the, the, the words and the phrasings are, are still Old English, so the biggest thing about it was standing there in the lodge come lodge night when it was time to perform. Or oh, just the fear of the unknown. Most people don't actually take things to well if, if they don't know exactly what's going to happen. So you're yeah, very nervous. In traditional Freemasonry, each of the three degrees takes place in the lodge and consists of a ritual and an allegorical play, followed by a study period of up to three months between each degree. In this period, the new Mason is expected to learn every element of the ritual work, word for word. On the night of my first degree, the place was full of people wearing suits and tuxedos, and some of them were wearing aprons with gold all over them and collars around their neck with gold chains that looked like the Lord Mayor. Brethren, I now declare this lodge duly and properly open, and that for the purpose of Masonry in the first degree. During the first degree, they put you through about a five-minute play. You play the part of a poor, blind person. So you don't have to really know your part to play it well. You're basically entering this blind. You don't know what's going to happen, uh, what they're going to do to you, if it's going to be like a normal fraternity where you have to, you know, uh, you know, run through the streets naked. You know, you do hear all the stories about what they, the secret societies and all that stuff, and I wasn't sure what the, the initiation process was going to be like, so I was a bit nervous. And you know, the first thing, the first goat I seen, I was going to be out that door. <laughs> the night before my first degree, the man called, and uh, he said, uh, "Yeah, uh, Mr. Chisholm, are you coming to the first degree?" I said, "Yes." He said, uh, "Well, I just want you to be there at seven o'clock and make sure you're wearing clean underwear." I said, oh. What do you mean by that? <laughs> and uh, the man spoke purposefully to spook me, but the point was I was going to be expected to change in a, in a changing room, in a man's changing room, where there would be other men doing the same thing. They may have joked and things like that outside, but once I was in with the brothers, it was a very solemn occasion, and it impressed me deeply. And uh, the apprehensions that I had before my first degree and that I had discussed with the brothers that I approached about becoming a masonry disappeared that very night. In the first degree, the candidate is prepared, one knee bared and blindfolded to symbolize the conditions under which we enter the world, naked and unknowing. He is then led between two pillars, representing the pillars of King Solomon's temple, to an altar of truth where he is brought to light and then given basic instruction. A poor candidate in a state of darkness who has been well and worthily recommended who now comes forward of his own free will and accord. After the first degree, I was very, uh, I felt very elated. Like, it was a different experience knowing that I went through at least one barrier. Having been kept for some considerable time in a state of darkness, what in your present situation is the predominant wish of your heart? Light. 
light. Brother Junior Deacon, let that blessing be restored. A as you get to talk about this little play, this allegorical play, um, it's drawn to your attention, you know, did you notice how this was connected to that and how when this man said this then that man said that you can go through your life and everything seems totally you know disconnected sometimes but perhaps if a wise enough person were to reveal the rhyme and reason to it to you then you might see that everything in life is interconnected and all the people and places and all the things you do in your actions are all, all connected. And uh, I enjoyed it immensely and couldn't wait to go back to the next degree. Under the square and compass and large letter G, the apprentice has shown the basic working tools of operative masons and the symbolic meaning of each is explained in painstaking detail. I now present to you the working tools of an entered apprentice Freemason. The 24 inch gauge is to measure our work. The common gavel to knock off all superfluous knobs and excrescences. And the chisel to further smooth and prepare the stone and render it fit for the hands of the more expert craftsmen. There may well be more young men today interested in the spirituality and traditions of masonry, but the masons are also making it easier for them to join. The masons are changing. I guess the big joke is, is uh, something like how many masons does it take to change a light bulb? And they looked at it, change, right, which was the answer of change. And I think they're going to change. I think we have to change it as an, as an organization. You see, the problem is that philosophically it, it's saying it preserving an ancient tradition uh, of masonry, as in everything else, the f essential philosophy doesn't need to be changed, uh, but things can change around it. Frankly, we have to change. You can't live on... 1900 attitudes in 2003 and, and that's where the, the problem lies you see and it's going to take another generational change I believe and, and then you're going to see people coming in. The biggest change in Freemasonry in the last 40 years is the idea that the three ancient degrees could be delivered to candidates en masse. Dozens or even hundreds at a time condense months of traditional work into a one-day ceremony. It's an experiment in mass production being tried by a few lodges, notably the Grand Lodge of New York. In New York, for instance, if we look at that lodge, you know, they've called a one-day ceremony yeah. where you pack in, however, what, eight months or however long it takes to get your three degrees into one day? Is that, and yet you still recognize them as You have to understand what's masons? really gone on there. Yep. The, the ceremony has taken place in one day. Yep. You still have to go back and learn your ritual by rote mm -hmm. and be able to deliver it individually in order to be fully where you need mm -hmm. to be. If you don't do that, then you're not a mason really mm -hmm. if, you don't, if you don't know mm -hmm. or understand that ritual. Three degrees in one day uh, came about uh, basically because of the statistics that a lot of other jurisdictions had shown me. It seemed that the participation of the individuals coming in under the one-day degree was, uh, was more so than it was in the traditional sense. If they can get out of, uh, out of three degrees in one day, the same sort of respect and, and usage and stuff that I give it over a, a year, six months, eight months, I'll, I'll be more averse and more comfortable with it than the guy that has it first through in a day. For me, I disagree with it but I'm not sure that I'm going to disagree with it tomorrow, you know, because I really change. And there's a, a major discussion going on in Masonry about right now about whether this is really the thing to do. And uh, right now, I don't, I don't like it, because I think that, we, that people that, that want to become Masons can become Masons in the old traditional ways. We're struggling right at the moment. It's a different age, and the young people are so busy having to scramble to make a living. They haven't the, the money or the time. The importance of the time sequence and either taking a first degree now and then two or three months later taking a second degree and two or three months later taking a third degree was a reason that they uh, felt was important to them that they couldn't spend that kind of time putting the degree 
uh, taking the degree. In other words, what they wanted was they wanted to become a Mason right away and then they could get involved and participate, and mainly because of the busy schedules. The whole idea of a progress through the degrees that offers moral and spiritual enlightenment of different types, the idea that you can, as it were, mass produce it, um, has seemed rather baffling to some British Masons. It's an interesting new development. You've had the opportunity for the last 40 years to prove that the way you're doing things in a fraternity is the right way and it's working. And obviously we saw that it wasn't working because we weren't bringing in enough members. The average age of a Mason in this fraternity today is around 68, 69 years of age. If you don't have enough Masons coming in, because if it, we don't have as many guys coming in, then it's just going to be a dying organization. But what difference would it make to the world if this ultimate old boys club died off with its aging members? For young Masons, the answer lies within the secret rituals about to be revealed to them. With a bond of brotherhood reaching to over 130 countries across the globe, the Masons are one big happy family, sort of. The world of Freemasonry is more like a system of loosely associated cells. Each lodge is free to interpret the charges sworn by every Mason, with consequences. You know, the Grand Lodge in New York is totally independent of the lodge here, all right? You know, we recognize each other, but we're independent. Organizations. But if they admitted women, you would, you probably wouldn't recognize them. That's yeah. true. We wouldn't. Well, it wouldn't. You know, it wouldn't take a big decision to do that. It, you, the Grand Master would probably decide. For the first time in 40 years, Masons are talking about some of their more controversial traditions. The new wave of Masons brings new ideas. I think we're coming to an age now where they're going to publish. You know, I, I don't know for sure. I'm not the head Mason person. But I think eventually they might allow women in there. I think, you know, it's 2004 now, and, and that, you know, it's, it's the women are the sh movers and shakers just as well as the men are these days. Why must it be a brotherhood, though? That's what I'm not quite sure I understand. Is what is the advantage of having it just men in terms of its purpose? Basically, we are on the, standing on the shoulders of the operative masons who, you know, back in the Middle Ages or whatever, who uh, basically were men, and that's the historical context. Traditionally, Masons have been men. As it stands right now in, in this year in Halifax, Masons are men. Will it change in the future? It's interesting. We should all watch and see, maybe. Yeah. See, that's, that's the part that people don't understand when they say, how come you don't let me, women be Masons? Because if we did, we wouldn't be Masons anymore. One of the things that we agree to when we become Masons is that this is one of the precepts. What really matters is the stature among Masons. The perceptions of society about Masonry really are of little concern except for the fact that we wish to be perceived as good men. Oaths of mutual aid have topped the list of prohibited subjects for Masons. Worldwide, charges of Masonic corruption abound in business, government, and law. Masons themselves see firsthand where men have joined the craft for nefarious reasons and contaminated the fraternity. As crisis looms, it's time to talk about who is on the square. Some people do join masonry to improve their circle of business contacts. They soon become known and are, they're generally not looked on favorably by other masons. I have friends that were very successful as businessmen or in different jobs that have told me that what they learned in masonry was a great help in getting a step up in the world. How something that is so fundamentally wedded to that idea that it's what you put into it as Freemasonry can readdress itself um, to a society where we're all much more interested in what we can get out of it is a big problem. I have a hard time with the word network. Sort of comes with the territory, but the word network implies, you know, if I provide a service and, hey, buddy, you know, come over here, I'll give you a deal. That's, there are, there are Freemasons that abuse that and have over history. And be devoid of favoritism and wholly impartial. 
be watchful over the treasury, have an eagle eye in every portion of his jurisdiction. In the one dollar bill, I believe that there's an eye of the mason, the all-seeing eye. Fifty years ago, in towns, not in big cities, in a little town, before women held positions of management, when it was all guys, then maybe Freemasonry did exert a different kind of influence over who got what and who did what and who was friends with whom. But to just blow off the idea of corruption within Freemasonry, oh. I think, is, is a little glib. They were bad Freemasons. There are bad Freemasons, it's the same as there are bad other people. Exactly. We are humans first, unfortunately. Okay? It would be nice if it could be the other way around, but it's not. But we are humans first. Do you view the Freemasonry with cynical eye? But do you think that, where do you think that, is it just, a, it's not, is it not, is it just that it's a fraternity or are there other things in, involved here? This is such great PR, I think, for Freemasonry. This, you know, it's like, of course you have the right to have anyone you choose put shingles on your roof, but if that many good men have become that so much better since 1650 in the Masons, somebody somewhere had to be corrupt. You're absolutely so I don't right, think and you don't know the half of it. You know, uh, in the uh, 19th century in America, there were the, an, an anti-Masonic political party was formed, and it was a popular ticket. I mean, they really held some sway because people were really concerned mid-century that, that masonry had gotten out of control. From what I know of them, which is like nothing, um, they're, they're scrutinized, aren't they? Kind of controversial people. To gain entry into this circle of uh, good fellows or something, as they call them, they have like all kinds of uh, terminology and language. You must uh, be probably uh, in business. You may, business would help. Be deliberate in judgment. Be prompt in execution. Be forbearing long and much with evil doers be ready to reward the good. Good job. Thank you, Harry. Good job. The business networking idea, I think, has to be put in a different context um, in the 18th and 19th century because it's all very much about, um, about fair dealing and a means of ensuring that you have fair dealing because you know that the other person has sworn an oath to be honourable. I don't know, if I was going to buy a car from two different people and one was a mason, the other guy wasn't, I would buy it from the mason because I would trust him implicitly just because he belonged to the order. Well, my father was, is a mason and continues to be, and the organization has really helped him and our family. And we always used to have this security blanket of if something happened, whether one of us was ill, that they would look after us. There is obviously an opportunity there to chat and network and get comfortable with. And, and you know, if a brother can do something to help another brother, I don't think you'd ever have a problem doing that. I'm not doing this for networking, you know. Some people may do it for networking. For me, it's joining a group that really believes in humanity and wants to do things to help others. And it so happens that some of them are important people, right? I wouldn't consider myself one yet, but hopefully someday. There are some people who join Freemasonry for that um, wrong reason, of joining for business connections, of joining for gain. And um, that's a point of corruption. And I have no problem saying that. And people who join that, in my mind, don't, don't join Freemasonry. They join their own greed. In the second degree, initiated fellow crafts stand on the symbolic porch of King Solomon's temple and get their first glimpse into the inner sanctum of the Mason's Lodge. The second degree, that entailed a lot of studying, a lot of memory work, a lot of dedication and discipline. That's what sort of comes with the territory. The memorization is, is, is similar to what you've already memorized, I've, I've already memorized, but that's all I really know about it. It's, it's gonna be more symbolism, um, and more memorization work. The fellow craft degree focuses the Mason's attention on the importance of science, and he is given instruction related to ancient geometry. Freemasons believe the letter G symbolizes the great architect of the universe, God, and geometry, the measurement of the earth and all things in it. 
In this way, they believe the G represents the connection between the earthly and spiritual aspects of existence. I now invest you with the distinguishing badge of a Mason. Passing that second degree, I really felt that that was a huge accomplishment for me. It being the badge of innocence and bond of friendship. And I strongly exhort you ever to wear and consider it as such. I came in 43 years ago. The first thing they told me when I became a Mason was, don't say anything to anyone. Secrecy didn't, it wasn't bothering people, and it had thousands of members, you know. And so they were happy, happy campus. And uh, things just were going nice. Uh, but that's how society viewed things. Society was a little, lot different then. People want to know today. You mean all these sort of perversions and unnatural acts that they're involved in? Is that the sort of thing you, you want to get at? <laughs> I want to think that they're okay, but because it's so secretive and everything, it's hard to know, and I kind of think it's weird. Because if you're not going to tell people what's going on, then it's hard to trust, you know, just based on the fact that they're saying it's a good organization. So, and I know that I'm a girl, so I would never know anyway, because it's only for men. Is, there an, is it just the secrecy, or do you think there's other elements into, in, in what, uh, how the free, Freemasonry is perceived that generate these conspiracy what they, what, theories? What, what, what do people think we're conspiring to do? Well, uh, Jane or Bruce, do you have any conspiracy well, I theories? I like conspiracy <laughs> theories for a reason. <laughs> One of the reasons we like conspir conspiracy theories is not mm. the reality of them. Mm. But I think they're, they're comforting in a weird way. Maybe they're the secret government. Maybe they're the ones that take care of the big picture, the very big picture. You know, those things that happen that are just sort of coincidentally, you know, happen. My other brother, he's just, he just thinks it's right, something else. He's always grilling me questions about what we're doing. And, you know, every time something happens in the world, it's like, you guys are behind that, aren't you? It's like, no, girl. <laughs> so. In terms of power, I don't think that there's this, uh, you know, like, there's this group of people that are kind of pulling all the strings of, uh, of uh, mm -hmm. government or anything like that. And certainly, in terms of that kind of um, thing to get out of masonry, that's what no one, there's not too many people that are into masonry for that. And if they are, there's something wrong. They're not in it for the right reason. Most people who are not Freemasons have never discussed Freemasonry with a Freemason. But I think we've got to change that. I think you know, the members themselves have got to talk about, about what they do. Not everything, but what they do, what Freemasonry stands for, the values of Freemasonry. Some of the things that we're talking about today are, are really personal with me, okay? But what we do is we try, we try to maintain through our contact with our inner self the, uh, the continuity, the ages that has helped develop human knowledge. So it's, it's not a secret, really. Brethren, behold your Grand Master. My father would never let us touch his case but we did on occasion have a peek inside and it was a, an apron in there with all the medals. Hey. Well, I, I, I know about the, 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 you know, you know, the only thing I know about Masonic is because the emblem, it's very interesting. I have no clue what it means and I know that a lot of presidents are Masons, <laughs> in U.S. anyway. You reveal yourselves to the society is one thing, but the Vic will not talk about the meaning of any of the symbols. The whole thing about symbols is, it's not, they're not completely ineffable, but you can't just chunk them down into a couple words. So if Vic says to you, oh, this symbol means this, then he's already done a disservice to the symbol. We're very proud of this piece of glass. On the upper rank, you will notice symbols. These symbols represent the actual working tools of the operative masons. We use the square as the right angle for being right, being just. The, the level that the operative mason used to signify that all of us are equal. We're on the same level. There's no high, there's no low, there's no rich, there's no poor. We're all the same. The plum teaches us that we're upright people. And all these tools have now a philosophical meaning to teach valuable ethical and moral lessons. We teach ourselves. We teach the young men that come into our craft. Secrecy consists of an invaluable adherence to the obligation you have entered into, never improperly to disclose, 
any of those modes of recognition which have now been or may at any future period be entrusted to your keeping. Freemasonry was very visible um, in the community up to the mid to late 30s. The Freemasons here saw what was happening in Germany, were frightened there was going to be an invasion, frightened the same thing would happen here, so they, they, they retreated underground. And of course there was also that whole thing about wars have ears, everybody became very secretive at that time. And, and in 1945, when the war ended, that for some strange reason, they didn't come out of the shadows. They stayed where they were. So for 40 years, until about 1984, Grand Lodge here had a, a policy of, of no comment. And really, it's only the last five or six years. We, we've been much more open. And you know, we've now got our own website because we feel we've got this wonderful product to sell. I mean, it is, it is just a, a wonderful organization. Most Masons are on the level, but the ultimate test of a new Mason is when he is given the third degree. I've done the study up to this point and I've seen their pass so far. Now it's just a matter of showing up and being able to make it all the way through the next degree. <laughs> I heard there's another person going through, so that makes it a little easier, from what I hear. Once the new Mason has symbolically passed through the first two degrees and memorized all the ritual, he is prepared for the third degree. Hey, Wes, nice to see you. Come out tonight. It's been a good turn, I'm right. looking forward to seeing Bruce. Yeah, Bruce has come dead. down from Turo, and, uh, her, and uh, Phil said he may be in, so it may be a good turnout tonight. Every regular Mason in the past 300 years has been given the third degree. Millions of men worldwide have experienced this epic test of faith, hope, and charity. Nothing about Masonry is more shrouded in mystery and folklore. Oh, Nervous, though. Nervous enough to uh, you, uh, even though you're ready. Uh, I didn't do jack until yesterday, and I spent three hours. That's not like you. No. I left everything at the last minute. Well, Tuesday, Sunday, Sunday. I did about, a, I did about an hours worth of work on Sunday and three hours yesterday. Going into the third degree, few Masons fully understand what they are about to experience. There are certainly a number of them that are going through tonight. I know that they're prepared. To, it's quite a big night for them. Two of them are, are my friends. Well, there's Dave Davis and uh, Aldrich Benson. And uh, I've been on them. <laughs> I've been on them, make sure that they know all, all the words. and. Uh, all the, all the script that they have to know. So it's, it's pretty big for them. Tonight they become official master masons, which is the big, the big thing, and uh, the third degree. In the third degree, the new mason plays the part of Hiram Abiff, the master builder of King Solomon's temple, who chose death rather than give up the secrets of his craft. You will kneel at the sacred altar, place both hands upon the volume of the sacred law. You will say, I pronounce your, lens, your names at length and repeat after me. The presence of Almighty God, the of Almighty God and the Grand Lodge. When his body was found by fellow Masons near the temple, Hiram was raised in a secret ceremony using a special grip and given Masonic burial. How did it go? Uh, oh, well. Yeah? Went okay. Had my moments in the sun. And and, and, and not in the sun, but it went well. It's just ex all excitement. <clears throat> no more, um, like, hesitation or, you know, feeling all flustered. They just went in all excited, you know, you're just going to get a third degree and be in the whole thing. I felt more part of their group there. Well, they all made me feel welcome from day one. I, I'm starting to feel like part of the family now. I, I consider every one of the brothers in law a friend, friends that I'll have for the rest of my life, because I thank them for that. It's hard for me to warm up to people, and these guys don't make it hard at all. At the end of that third degree, everyone in the lodge stood up and came over and shook my hand and welcomed me as a brother. It felt like I belong, and I do belong. Quite something to feel you have brothers, you have people there for you. Um, for moral support, 
for physical support, like, you know, if your house fell over, whatever the case, you know, your brothers would be there right away. Should you, at any future period, meet a Mason in distressed circumstances uh, who might solicit your assistance, and you will cheerfully embrace the opportunity of practicing that virtue which you have professed to admire. The most interesting thing will be to come back in five or six years and see how many of them have stuck with it. Um, historically, um, Masons have often taken great pride in very long periods of membership. 50, 60 years you hear people celebrating that sort of length of time. For more than 300 years, Freemasonry has publicly and privately demanded the highest standards of integrity from its members. Some people come to Lodge because they want that living space and they want answers. And sometimes Freemasonry gives you philosophical answers that are interesting to explore. If as many young people would know what Freemasonry is about, then we'd have uh, many lodges full of energy. It's a great pleasure for me to present you with your color and jewel of your office. Congratulations, my brother. You have to be a good person. You know, have to, your proposal in a second have to be sure that you're a person of integrity. And these are people of integrity. Ever mindful, though, that well, he is elevated for a time above his fellows, that he is elevated by them. And he is yet a craftsman, more sacredly bound by a craftsman's obligations. You see, Freemasonry is definitely an old thing. You know, I think modern day is very much a disposable sort of mentality. You know, you buy something, you throw it away. Freemasonry is the opposite of that. It's a lifelong commitment. I think that we can all look in our lives those of us who are non-Masons and think to ourselves, okay, where have I experienced something that sounds, you know, like the concept of haven, which is something that I yeah. think everyone can uh, subscribe to. You know, when I became a Mason, the first night when I took my first degree, that's the thing that sticks in my mind. These guys want me to make a promise to them and not to break it all your life. We're here to fit ourselves as living stones in that spiritual building, that house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. There you go. I mm -hmm. love that one. Yeah.